A warm welcome to TV African News and thank you for always joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Najima Luima. But first are the headlines. Parliament suspended after Kampala explosions. Aigigi summons 18 Wubos officials over staff victimization. Democratic Republic of Congo's climate activists call for more stern actions. And in sports, Masengere group teams officials tasted for COVID-19. A warm welcome and once again now the news in detail. The Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Anita Amonk, has suspended Parliament and asked the legislators to remain at home. The decision comes minutes after suspected bomb explosions ripped through the city at two different locations on a Tuesday morning. We have more. Will Davison of the International Crisis Group say that about 10 days ago now they took control of Desi and Kombolcha cities two major Amhara cities and that put them in another significant advance and that's about 400 kilometers from Addis Ababa. His comments came after Tigray forces seized the key cities of Desi and Kombolcha last week and linked up with another armed group leading the government of Africa's second most populous country to declare a national state of emergency. Meanwhile, the president of Tigray region, Debretsion Gebremicho, said his forces were aiming to destroy the government either by negotiation or by force. He said that by strangling Tigray, the government has denied Tigray access to food and medicine, adding that he has denied the provision of other services too, so that people die because of hunger and diseases. He further said that the government continued with its air bombing on grounds that it's working on its project of decimating Tigray from the face of the earth. He said that they had to destroy the enemy by moving their forces outside of Tigray to crush and break the siege, adding that in the end, the enemy should be destroyed. The war has killed thousands of people since it erupted in November 2020. But with Tigrayan fighters advancing towards the capital, Ethiopia now stands at risk of collapse. The Ombudsman has summoned at least 18 top officials from the Uganda Bureau of Statistics as investigations into alleged victimization of staff, conflict of interest and corruption gathers pace. The Inspectorate of Government is spokesperson Ms. Ali Munila, however, declined to reveal identities of other 13 officials who are said to be managers. Kachanchi reports. The Inspectorate of Government's spokesperson, Ms. Ali Munira, confirmed that some of the officials started recording statements last week. She added that the officials include five people who were last week interdicted by Finance Minister, Mr. Matia Kasaija. These include the UBOS Executive Director, Dr. Chris Mukiza, the Chairperson Board of Directors, Dr. Albert Biamgisha, Dr. Wamala, a board member, Ms. Florence Obira, the Acting Head of Finance, and Mr. David Ocheng, the Head of Internal Audit. The interdiction of the officials followed an October 9th directive to Mr. Kasaija from the Inspector General of Government, Ms. Betty Kamia. Ms. Kamia revealed that preliminary investigations in the management of UBOS provided sufficient ground for Inspector General of Government to continue with the investigations to their logical conclusion. Sources provided to the investigations told the media that the Inspector General of Government would, among others, examine all certified copies of the integrated finance management system payment schedules and records. She will also pour over bank accounts of staff who allegedly received the funds and all other payments outside the IFMS. A whistleblower reportedly petitioned President Museveni on August 10th, alleging among other things corruption, victimization and illegal suspension of employees at the statistics agency. The whistleblower alleges that the money was withdrawn by top officials and wired to bank accounts of junior staff who would then be instructed to withdraw and return the cash. Environment activists and ecologists in the Democratic Republic of Congo reacted on Sunday to the agreements reached at the COP26 climate summit, demanding more actions from all countries to enact the declarations. So we have more on this report. Within the negotiations, countries agreed to focus on the most ambitious goal of the 2015 Paris Accord, 
keeping global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Experts and vulnerable activities have long advocated that threshold, but some nations previously clung on to the option of aiming for well below 2 centimeters. The Glasgow Climate Pact also included enough financial incentives to almost satisfy poorer nations and solved a long-standing problem to pave the way for carbon trading. Ecologist Gideon Bakeresi told the media that makala, a form of charcoal, was widely used for cooking in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the absence of reliable electricity. He said the country needed significant financial aid to reduce its reliance on makala and to put up its usage of clean energy. There was also an agreement by nations to explicitly target fossil fuel subsidies, though the original proposals were greatly watered down. The agreement also said big carbon-polluting nations would have to come back and summit stronger emission-cutting pledges by the end of 2022. Environmental activist Olivia Ndole said the commitments made by Congo as well as other wealthier nations at the summit such as France and the U.S., sent a strong signal. Negotiators say the deal preserved, albeit barely, the overarching goal of limiting Earth's warming by the end of the century to 1.5 degrees. The planet has already warmed 1.1 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial times. Let's take a very quick short break. We will be right back. Welcome back, you're still watching TV African News at the right to know. To Brianna forces, a battling the Ethiopian government could be poised to seize the country's main trade route at the Djibouti corridor, a top expert on the conflict said Monday. Will Davison of the International Crisis Group said such a move would put significant economic pressure on the government in Addis Ababa. Will Davison of the International Crisis Group say that about 10 days ago now, they took control of Desi and Kombolcha cities, two major Amhara cities, and that put them in another significant advance, and that's about 400 kilometers from Addis Ababa. His comments came after Tigray forces seized the key cities of Desi and Kombolcha last week and linked up with another armed group leading the government of Africa's second most populous country to declare a national state of emergency. Meanwhile, the president of Tigray region, Debretsion Gebremicho, said his forces were aiming to destroy the government either by negotiation or by force. He said that by strangling Tigray, the government has denied Tigray access to food and medicine, adding that he has denied the provision of other services too, so that people die because of hunger and diseases. He further said that the government continued with its air bombing on grounds that it's working on its project of decimating Tigray from the face of the earth. He said that they had to destroy the enemy by moving their forces outside of Tigray to crush and break the siege, adding that in the end, the enemy should be destroyed. The war has killed thousands of people since it erupted in November 2020. But with Tigrayan fighters advancing towards the capital, Ethiopia now stands at risk of collapse. Moving on, Libya's military prosecutor Mohamed Garuda has asked the electoral body to hold processing the paperwork for the presidential candidacy of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi. Uh, the prosecutor also asked that the paperwork for warlord Khalifa Haftal, who is also seeking the presidency, be suspended. Let's take a look. Libya's military prosecutor Mohamed Garuda has asked the electoral body to hold processing the paperwork for the presidential candidacy of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, the son of the country's late ruler Muammar Gaddafi. The electoral commission on Sunday said that Mr. Gaddafi had submitted the necessary documents as a presidential candidate in the elections set for next month. 
But in a letter to the Electoral Commission, Mr. Garuda warned that the Commission would be held responsible for consequences if the processing of the paperwork was not halted. The Military Attorney General's Office said in a letter that Saif al-Islam and Khalifa Haftar have been accused of criminal acts and their presidential bids must be halted until the investigation is completed. The registration of Mr. Gaddafi's candidacy, although expected, has jolted people in Libya and abroad for his role in the brutal crackdown of the uprising against his father's rule. He is still wanted by the International Criminal Court on charges of war crimes committed in 2011. Mr. Haftar, who leads forces in eastern Libya, is wanted by a United States court for allegedly torturing Libyans during the war. Away from that, uh, the Constitutional Court of the Democratic Republic of Congo ruled on Monday in Kinshasa that it had no jurisdictions to try former Prime Minister Augustine Matata on charges of embezzlement of public funds, leaving it to other judges. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Constitutional Court is the criminal judge of the President of the Republic and the Prime Minister in the office. According to the Constitutional Court President Diedone Kabula at a public hearing, without specifying which judges the former Prime Minister should be referred to, the privilege of jurisdiction ceases with the office adding that Mr. Matata must be prosecuted before his natural judge. Consequently, Mr. Matata cannot be prosecuted before the Constitutional Court, which declares itself incompetent, according to Kabula. Augustine Matata Ponyo's lawyer had pleaded the Constitutional Court's incompetence during a hearing on November 8th, pointing out that their client, who was the Prime Minister from 2012 to 2016 under the regime of former President Joseph Kabila, had not been in office for several years. As a senator, Mr. Matata should be referred to the Court of Cassation, which has jurisdiction over parliamentarians, according to his lawyers. Protected by his parliamentary immunity, he can only be prosecuted after authorization from the Senate. The former head of government is being prosecuted alongside Patrice Kitebi, former minister of finance at the time of the events, and the South African national, Grobla Christo, manager of a South African company. All three are suspected of embezzling more than 200 million US dollars in public funds intended for the Bukanga Alonso Agri Industrial Park, 250 kilometers southeast of Kinshasa, while Matata was Prime Minister. Let's once again take a very quick short break. We will be right back. <music> Welcome back. You're still watching TV Africa News at the right to know in our business. News today, Dutch brewing giant Heineken will buy a majority stake in brewers in South Africa and Namibia. Companies said on Monday, creating a buzz behemoth in a region currently dominated by rival Ahose Basch in Bev. We have more. Heineken plans to acquire South Africa's distill and Namibia breweries in a combined deal valued at around 4.6 billion US dollars. Heineken CEO Dolph van den Brink in a statement said that they are very excited to bring together three strong businesses to create a regional beverage champion perfectly positioned to capture significant growth opportunities in Southern Africa. Distel CEO Richard Rushton said that he saw the deal as having the potential to leverage the strength of Heineken's global footprint with their leading brands to create a formidable diverse beverage company for Africa. Amsterdam-based Heineken is the world's number two brewer behind Belgian Brazilian giant AB InBev. In 2016, AB InBev took over South African jewelries as part of a blockbuster sub Miller buyout and enjoys an estimated 80% of the beer market by volume in South Africa.
In our health news today, about 2 million people who have not been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 have been placed in lockdown in Austria as the country faces a surge in cases. The measures introduced in Austria on Monday, which come amid growing pressure on the nation's hospitals, will initially last 14 days. About 2 million people who have not been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 have been placed in lockdown in Austria as the country faces a surge in cases. According to Chancellor Alexander Skallenberg, they are not taking that step lightly, emphasizing that although it's unfortunately, it is necessary. He added that unvaccinated people will only be allowed to leave home for limited reasons like working or buying food. About 65% of Austria's population is fully vaccinated, one of the lowest rates in Western Europe. Meanwhile, the seven-day infection rate is more than 800 cases per 100,000 people, which is one of the highest in the region. Overall, Europe has again become the area most seriously affected by the pandemic and several countries are introducing restrictions and warnings of rising cases. However, the United Kingdom, which has one of the highest COVID infection rates, has yet to reintroduce restrictions despite health leaders calling for rules like mandatory face coverings in crowded and enclosed spaces to be brought back to avoid a winter crisis. Children under the age of 12 and the people who have recently recovered from the virus will be exempted. Over the weekend, hundreds of people protested outside the chancellery in the capital of Vienna, waving banners that read, Our bodies, our freedom to decide. In our sports news today, there are barely five days to the kick-off of the 2021 Masaza Cup Championship at the FUFA Technical Center in Jeru, Buikwe District. All players and officials that will be part of the Masaza Cup 2021 in Jeru ought to have been vaccinated and tested for COVID-19. Kachanchu has more. As a precondition set by the organizers that all players and officials in Injeru have to be vaccinated and tested for COVID-19, the exercise to test has been held on Monday, November 15, 2021, at Vulange Mengo in Kampala. Referees, organizing committee officials, stewards, players and officials for three teams in Masengere group were also tested for COVID-19. Gomba chairperson Mansur Kabugo expressed readiness for his team who are the defending champions. Kabugo revealed that they have had two weeks of intense training and build-ups, adding that the players are focused ahead of the kickoff for the 2021 Masaza Cup tournament in Injeru. In Masengere group, there is record champion Gomba, Chadondo, Bululi, Singo and Kabula. Mugan's Raza group has 2020 losing finalists Vudu, Busuju, Maogora, Buwekura and Butambala. Third place team in 2020 Busiro groups up with Bugerere, Chagwe and Islanders Vuvuma in Bulange group. 2012 and 2019 champions Bulemezi are in the same Butikiro group as Kochi, Maokota and the other island team Sese. Last year, a 10-man Gomba overcame Budu 3-1 in a one-sided finale played at the Federation for Uganda Football Association's Technical Center, Njeru. That ends our news today. Thank you for watching. Please do stay tuned. More programming coming your way.